Um, I, uh, th thank you very much for that. I'm going to talk about, um, come at things from a very different angle. I'm going to be talking about aggregate data. And as Paolo said, what, what we mean by aggregate data is uh, all that data that comes out of, of the interactions, particularly with things such as health, education, community safety, areas of life in which the state plays a very big role, either as a payer, often as a provider, uh, areas where the information that is produced is enormously personal, uh, but data that I think is fantastically powerful uh, for, for the individual. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and how I uh, came to be working with aggregate data and what I think, uh, you know, what, some ideas about where it might go in the future. My background, as, as Benjamin just said, is I was a, uh, a journalist and back in the 80s I did lots of uh, reporting on financial scams and uh, legal scams and areas where people kind of used information to uh, uh, get the better of other people. Uh, and then I went to, uh, as a reporter to Silicon Valley and worked in California for a bit. Uh, and then my parents fell in and I came back and uh, was living in England and started uh, this, this business, which, kept, which was really when it started, it wasn't really, we weren't thinking about aggregate data. Um, and uh, often when people, when people think about aggregate data in healthcare, you often get this kind of, there's a lot of hype around about big data and real world evidence and, you know, examples of how we're going to discover fantastic new treatments or, or, or work out what really works and doesn't work. And this is all good stuff. I've got no problem with any of this stuff. It's, 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 it's probably a bit more hype than reality at the moment, but you know, there's, there's some useful, useful work going on there. But my, my experience is, is really a very different one, and, and my story starts back in 1993, when uh, this is a, a woman called Maria Edwards, uh, and that is her child Jasmine, who died in 1993 uh, after undergoing an operation in, at Bristol Royal Infirmary. And she felt something wasn't quite right. Uh, and nobody was telling her what was wrong. Uh, and so she started to contact other people and she formed a protest group. And they started to hold meetings outside the hospital uh, and it became very emotional. They were carrying small coffins to represent their children that had died. Uh, and there was eventually, it led to a inquiry being set up. And that is a... a, a <laughs> A screenshot there just showing the sort of the BBC news track around this time, um, just to give you a sense of the conversation that was going on. I'm not perfect, says Bristol surgeon. Baby surgeon, I was a scapegoat. Surgeon admits skills were in question. I like this one. Rylance, the chief executive, I knew nothing. I'm doing a great job there. <laughs> uh, you've got um, uh, claims are exaggerated, um, uh, surgeon breaks down. Uh, I was unlucky to lose patients or baby deaths were part of learning. These are all explanations put forward for what was going on. But the thing that in the end nailed it completely was this, which was basically the data that had been collected by the NHS for ages, which just tell, basically described who had come into the hospital, what had happened to them, and whether or not they had survived or gone home. And this was done by a man called Brian Jarman at, at Imperial College. And it's what really brought that whole conversation to an end because it was very clear when you looked at the data that Bristol was very different. That, that red dot that's higher than all the others, that is the mortality rate at Bristol. But what's even more important about this was not, not that that was brought that argument to an end, but that this is what it looked like shortly afterwards. And that Bristol's come in. And if you look nationally, you can see that the the mortality rate at Bristol has fallen, it's come back into line, and across the whole country, the mortality rates have improved. Now, when all this was happening, I, I, I had just come back from, from California and was trying to um, uh, think of a way of, 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 of you know, earning a living and was increasingly interested in healthcare. And so we started an organization called Dr. Foster. And Brian Jarman and his team had been doing this sort of work. They had written occasionally to the Department of Health and said, look, these data are amazing. We have these fantastic, this fantastic resource of information, and we're not doing anything with it. And they kept saying, well, could we publish some of this stuff? And at the time, to get hold of this data, you had to sign the Official Secrets Act. And you can go to jail if you, if you misuse it. And, and the, the various health secretaries had written back to Brian and said, no, definitely not. This is all uh, private and confidential information, and you, you have to get permission before you release it. And then what happened was there was a sudden, because of these events at Bristol, there was a sudden change of heart and a realization that actually it, it, that these data needed to be used more. And 
at the same time, we turned up and sort of said, look, we want to start publishing information for the public about healthcare. We want to be able to give them what information we can about quality. And we'd met Brian, and Brian had said, well, I think I've got tons of information, but it's illegal for me to publish it. And in the end, we, the Department of Health agreed that by working with the university department, that they were going to be allowed to have access to this data, and we could start to publish information. So we began to publish stuff. We began to start publishing information about what was going on. Um, I'm now going to skip forward about uh, five years to 2005. And uh, this is a woman called Bella Bailey, who died in Mid Staffordshire Hospital in 2005 after a long and uh, extremely aggravating uh, series of episodes in the hospital, which drove her daughter, Julie Bailey, to such despair and rage that she too started a a movement. Uh, this is the cafe that she opened. And this cafe became a sort of a, a, a centre for people in, in Stafford to come and talk about what they felt was happening uh, at their local hospital, um, about the, uh, some really dreadful experiences that, that they had suffered. And she started to collect all these stories together and organise letter-writing campaigns, and she lobbied her, her MP. And the, the trust the hospital was not very sympathetic to this. This is a, a small extract from, um, uh, from uh, the parliamentary record. And as you can see, the, the MPs there describing a, a, a young man who fell off his bike and fractured some ribs. He went to Stafford Hospital. They failed to identify that he had a ruptured spleen. Uh, he was discharged. He was in extreme pain. And he subsequently died. Um, and the, 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 the quote there is from the letter from the chief executive of the family just saying that, you know, it's time to move on and put this behind you. But they were not prepared to do that, and they continued to campaign. And what was, what was interesting about this time around, there was something a little different, which was that at the same time, we were now publishing information. So we were publishing information that showed very clearly that Mid Staffordshire had very poor outcomes for its patients. And there's a lot of argument about this data, a lot of argument about, well, what does it really mean and have you adjusted enough, et cetera. But there was data out there that, that indicated there was potentially a problem. And at the same time, we were providing much more detailed information to hospitals. And one of the nice things about this data, because it's produced, it's sort of, it's churned out by the system as, it's, as, it's, as it treats people. You can, you can start to sort of look at things over time. And we were doing a lot of these sorts of charts where we're tracking over time what happens to each patient as they come into hospital. What is their outcome? And, and if, if, there's a, if things start to look wrong, the line moves in the wrong direction, and it triggers an alert. And so we'd started to write letters that when these things triggered alerts, we would, we would then write a letter to people. Um, and, oh, sorry, that went a bit fast. But broadly speaking, what happened in 2006, what I was supposed to show you there, was that we started getting alerts about Mid Staffordshire. When we first set up the system, the first, one of the first things that came out was that Mid Staffordshire, this looks bad, so a letter went off. And then another one went, came, came up and went off. Another one. And, and after about 12 months, six letters had gone off saying things look really bad at Mid Staffordshire. And eventually, uh, the regulator took an interest and investigated. There was then a public inquiry led by Robert Francis, which then produced a, it, you know, it all came out. People were asked to come forward and talk about their stories. And it is a remarkable document, the, the output of this inquiry, which is just story after story of people arriving and being treated really ex very poorly with very little respect, uh, often misdiagnosed, often basic care not being provided, and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of damage and suffering as a result. So when we sort of say, what, what, if we ask the question, what has aggregate data ever done for me? I think the first question to say about this is this is not about clinical trials. It's not about discovering new treatments. The first thing to just, just to focus on, this is about what is actually happening to people. It are, is our healthcare system actually making people better? Is it helping them? Or is it doing something rather different? And just to explore that a bit more, I mean, the importance of that point is that it's really important for people to see data about what is what is happening now? There's, to give you one example, there's, a, there's a, been a lot of academic work which has highlighted this issue. For, that, for example, if you, are, if you are treated in a hospital at a weekend, it looks like the quality of care degrades pretty seriously. And there's been a, a, a number of academic papers that have made this point. But they have failed to have much impact on the actual way in which healthcare is delivered. 
And certainly in the UK, what, what helped enormously was to being able to start saying, not, this, is not, this is not some abstract theoretical thing. This is actually happening now in our hospitals, and we can actually measure the difference, and we can say precisely what it looks like. We can identify the fact that the, the aspects of particular hospitals contribute to this, so that if, you know, not, no great surprise, but we can see that if you have fewer doctors, fewer senior doctors in your hospital at a weekend, you are less likely to survive your, your stay in hospital. We can see how it changes over time, and we can see international differences. We can see that in the UK with stroke care, we have been particularly poor at weekend care, but that it has got, got a lot better. And I like this one particularly. This is one which this is, this is saying, showing that this is a, about patients who are admitted for an elective operation. It's a planned operation. They've come into hospital, uh, and what it shows is that your chances of surviving that operation vary significantly by the day on which you are operated in one direction, which is the closer your operation happens to the weekend, the less likely you are to survive. And what's, what's, what's important about this, these, these differences in reality, they're quite small differences because these are low-risk operations. And you would never be able to see this just, just from your own practice. You'd never be able to understand that this is happening. But because, one of the powers of aggregate data is because we have such large numbers and we can see across the whole system, we can pick up this and it's one more piece of evidence that then persuades people, okay, there really must be something going on. We do need, we do need to address this. And that, I think that's quite an important point because often what these data are being used is to highlight issues that are uncomfortable for people to accept. They don't want to necessarily believe this stuff. Um, and I want to give you another example just to move away from healthcare, to talk about education. I do, I'm involved in various healthcare uh, education organizations as well, including one that is the, uh, looks after qualifications in the UK. And we had a, a, a big row earlier this year about uh, the reliability of teachers marking their own pupils' work. And that chart shows you the, the average difference between an independent assessment of the marks given for a piece of work and the teacher's own assessment. And as you can see, it's very clearly skewed in one direction. But what's crucial about this is that when we, put, we were able to put together all the data about qualifications, we could see that if you look at an area like Wales, where they do not have um, strong penalties for schools for failing to get children over certain grades, you get a pretty normal distribution of the, the way that marks pan out. If you look at in England, where schools are strongly incentivized to get children over certain grades, you get this sort of picture. And as you might imagine, where those little peaks are is just the right side of the grade boundary. Um, and it was this data, this kind of big data, that finally led to people accepting. So Fiona Miller is a, uh, a left-wing journalist in the UK who has for ages been saying it's wrong to say this about teachers. A controlled assessment is, is terrific. It's really mean that people are saying teachers are doing bad things. Uh, and, it, and it's not really about teachers doing bad things. It's about if you build a system this way, it's going to produce this result. And, but it, it's that data that finally gets Fiona Miller to say, OK, this is true, this is real, there is something going wrong here. And, and it matters because, you know, ultimately this is what has happened in the UK, which is grade inflation where the, we appear, we are living under the illusion that we're getting more and more children uh, better educated and through exams, when in fact all we're doing is um, degrading the, the standard to which we are uh, trying to, uh, get, get kids to get kids to. So, one of the, I think one of the key things about aggregate data is, is it, it, it tells you stuff that, that people who might not want to hear. And the crucial aspect about this is these assets, these data assets, they are public assets. They belong to all of us. And the crucial bit is that they, they often they exist with inside organizations that may not want to hear what the data has to say. But the great thing about these data is they can tell us what is going on and make plain stuff that we otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't know. And, and just on that point about public assets, the other crucial thing is just to go back to the, this, this issue that, um, oh, there you go, um, that, that a lot of what we have done has been around publishing information, as I say, and making stuff public. And so on one level, the, probably the most important level has been this, simply this making the, the public aware so that if they are concerned, they have something else, they have something outside, that something solid that they can hold on to and say, yeah, okay, this is not just, this is not just my imagination, there really is an issue here. And so uh, it, it, it helps patient groups uh, and organizations to campaign for the, the sorts of healthcare services that they want. Um, it, uh, uh, 
Uh, and so just to give you an example of this, I mean, one of the, this is an example showing, showing sort of the, the degree to which people are treated promptly and that we know that it has an impact on outcomes. But we, we don't just sort of say this is, this is the, the issue. We can actually tell you which hospitals do well and which do poorly. Or in this example, we can say uh, we know that hospitals that perform this particular operation very rarely have much worse outcomes. So we can sort of say if you want to protect yourself, it's a good idea to avoid those sort of hospitals, and then we can publish the information about which are the hospitals that are causing a problem. So the, 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 sort of the, the final benefit is, is, is to say it's, it's, it's about not just about it, do we know how the system is working. It's fee, it's, it, in theory, it can help you as an individual understand whether the services that you are, uh, are, are accessing are the, are the right services for you. But probably on that last point, and that last point was really is, was where Dr. Foster started, and that was the thing we most really wanted to um, crack. It's fair to say that, that, that in reality, it's, it's not had the impact that we would like because the data is still, it's very high level. And unless you are in a very extreme situation, unless you think that the services are really dreadful, it tends to not be sufficiently specific for people to have much confidence that this data about an organization, about a system, or about a particular uh, clinic is really relevant to their situation. Um, it's very useful, but it doesn't necessarily get to that level. And one of the responses to that issue has been to say, well, this is, this is great stuff. We've just got to make it better. So we've just got to make the data more personal. We've got to start bringing together the longitudinal record so we can see what happens across the whole, whole, whole history of care. We've got to start linking different areas together. We've got to see how education and health care and, 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 and diet all interact with each other. We've got to start, add, let's add in the genomic data. Let's, let's put it all into one massive great pile and then we'll understand everything. Um, but there's, there's obviously a, a problem about going down that route, which is that you are starting to create ever scarier data assets which leads uh, to uh, heightened concerns about, well, all these, all these questions as to what's actually happening to this data, who is controlling it, uh, and uh, what are they allowed to do with it. Um, so if we sort of say, well, where do we go from here? What, what do we need to, how do we, how do we address this? Can we, can, we, can we continue to develop aggregate data sources and make them useful uh, without, uh, running into the problems of these data being uh, misused and giving too much power to people who we don't want to have this power. And I th there's, there's a sort of, a, you know, just a, a few obvious points here. I think, just going back to Anne's talk, brilliant, brilliant talk, and I think one of the key issues that we've got wrong here is that these data on the whole are not actually accessible to the individuals themselves, which is an extraordinary failing. And it is not surprising that people have very little trust in a system that uses an awful lot of data about them but does not let them actually see, see that data. We still haven't really established the legal frameworks to, to do this. Um, uh, Dr. Foster is an interesting and unusual because we work with identifiable data. You know, we have, we have it all, we have the name, et cetera. So we have to go through a very high, and it, it's done through a university, and it has to go through a clear public interest test. But public interest tests are not well, uh, they're not uniformly applied, and they are not, um, uh, there's a lot of work to do to define these appropriately. Um, an important point for me, and something that, 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 that has been a principle at Dr. Foster, has been this idea that there needs to be transparency around how the system works in terms of who accesses data and how it is. But I think there also needs to be a duty on anybody who takes public asset data to be transparent about what they have done with it. You can't build IP in these data sets. You need to be transparent about for, and enable anyone else to be able to say, OK, well, someone else who holds the data to be able to say, well, it is possible for me to replicate what you have done. And I think that process is potentially enormously beneficial uh, and, and obviously contrasts enormously with what has happened often in the past with, with proprietary data sets. Um, there is a, there's a, you know, the technical standards about actually how you make this data secure remain often very patchy and the auditing of them uh, remains weak. But I really just wanted to end focusing on this, this last point, which is these are public data assets and they have the power that potentially uh, can be enormously useful to you and me. Um, but there is there's a real issue about, well, who, is, who, who do we think are the right organisations to own 
manage, control these data. And um, there are very few organizations who don't have conflicts of interest. Government obviously has a clear conflict of interest. Anybody who's actually involved in, in delivery of any kind of service has a potential conflict of interest. And to give you a sense of the difficulty, I'll just describe to you the structure of Dr. Foster. Dr. Foster is a private company that funds a, an academic research unit which holds the data, which is half owned by the government, and which has established its own oversight, legal oversight structure through an ethics committee that is an independent company limited by guarantee. Now that is a massively complicated structure that is put in place to attempt to build something out of the parts available that looks like the sort of organization that ought to be able to hold public asset data. But I think that's, that's kind of a bit of a, uh, a, a clunky solution. And I think there is an issue about we've, we've got to define what types of organizations and how they're going to be structured that are going to be allowed to manage these data assets and, and control them in a way that is, is, ensures that they are used for the, for the public benefit. Thank you very much.